centuries ago, before Europeans arrived in North America, Native Americans known as the Tongva made their home on the land of Southern California's coastal plain we now call Torrance. They lived off the land, grinding acorn for meal. They were Torrance's first farmers. The original natives, the Tongva Indians, and even the Spanish and the Mexicans, people, the, the European and, and other immigrants that came here, came here to farm the land and to ranch the land, and everything that happened in our area that was created was created by farmers, and so they're very influential in what Torrance has become. When the Spanish arrived in California in the late 1700s, many Native Americans dispersed, were overcome by European diseases, or were gathered around the California missions. In 1784, Sergeant Juan Jose Dominguez of the Spanish Land Force received his retirement bonus in land. His parcel encompassed 75,000 acres of Rancho San Pedro. The rancho included present-day Torrance, Palos Verdes, Lamita, Wilmington, Gardena, Compton, Carson, among other South Bay cities. Juan Jose Dominguez lived on the rancho in this adobe, seen here much later in ruins. He ran cattle here until his death in 1809. He left the rancho to his nephew, Sergeant Cristobal Dominguez, who in turn left it to his son, Manuel Dominguez, upon his death in 1825. Manuel Dominguez married Maria Gracia Dakota in 1827 and built this home for her on Dominguez Hill. The Dominguez Adobe, as it's known, is located in the city now called Carson. They raised 10 children there and prospered for the next 55 years. In 1912, a millionaire financier living in South Pasadena named Jared Sidney Torrance set his sights on building a new industrial city on the flatlands between Los Angeles and the San Pedro Harbor. But at that time, the land already had its own thriving industry. And the farming was here when he got here. I mean, we had, we had ranchos, you know, we had the um, Sepulveda family and the Dominguez family fighting over the land. Benjamin Stone Weston came at the end of the 1800s before Jared Sidney Torrance came here. He, he was able to buy some land that was still being disputed by uh, those families. I mean, he had 3,000 acres. He was the largest landholder. Weston purchased the land for a sum of $525 in 1847. The Weston Ranch ran from Madison Street to the Lameda City Line and from Sepulveda Boulevard to the Palos Verdes foothills. Weston and his extended family raised cattle and horses on the hillsides and crops such as hay, beans, alfalfa, oats, and barley on the lower flatlands. The crops thrived in the South Bay's warm, sunny climate with little or no irrigation. It contributed a lot to the economy that, that enabled or that made the, the area more desirous for Jared Sidney Torrance. The farmers and the ranchers were the largest um, economic engine in the area until he started to develop it and created you know, the steel companies and all the other companies came afterwards. That's what really changed things is when rail started coming in, we were close enough where you know, they used to take um, sugar beets and barley and wheat on rail cars down to this train station in, in, at the port in Redondo and ship them off. The 1920s kicked off agriculture's heyday in Torrance and the South Bay. It was during this time that many Japanese families, such as the Amatsus, began leasing land for farming. The farm was in Torrance on Hawthorne and Carson uh, Torrance Boulevard. Uh, they started raising strawberries from 1922 until 1937. And then after 37, they start raising uh, flowers. Jack Takishi Yamatsu's father, Sakamatsu, moved to California from Hawaii, where he had worked for a sugar cane company. In California, he met and married Jack's mother, Hanayo, and eventually started his own strawberry ranch in Torrance, where Jack was born in 1929. I was born out on a farm. A doctor came to deliver me there. In fact, both of my brothers were born there. He remembers his childhood fondly. We used to play with all the kids. And, and the Mexican families, we used to know in Torrance. We used to have fun. We, we all went to, to uh, Fern Avenue School in Torrance. We caught the school bus that came picked us up out the country. We had a barn and we had a horse named Rose, Rosie. And, and, and he, my dad used to 
to uh, plow and, uh, and clear the field uh, with the horse. Life on the farm was happy until World War II, when everything changed dramatically for the Amatsus and other Japanese families in the area. They had to quickly abandon work at their farms and move to internment camps outside Southern California. We were lucky because uh, Utah Idaho Sugar Beet Company wanted workers, so my, my folks signed up for it. So we went on a special train to Utah in 1942. After the war, the Amatsus returned to Torrance and leased 10 acres of land off of Delamo and Hawthorne Boulevard. They raised flowers, such as the official city flower, the hybrid delphinium. The flower growers made more money than the, than the, the, the farmers, the Japanese farmers. So my folks made good money in the flower ranch. Once rail cars became refrigerated, that was a huge you know, commodity. I mean, everybody, every postcard you saw would advertise things like our flowers. Meanwhile, across town in North Torrance on Van Ness Avenue, Richard Hudson and his brothers were living a parallel life. But instead of harvesting the land, his father had his stock in livestock, milk cows at Hudson Dairy. The farm's original barn, milk house, and store still stand today right next door to his childhood home. We had a milk truck delivered in South Los Angeles area. We never uh, became a, a big dairy. We were just uh, smaller, uh, 42 cows. Well, of course, we expanded that, and uh, over the years, we had, we had got up to as high as 65 cows. They had a vacuum of milkers, milking machines, and uh, it was, we had three, three milk house units, we, and our barn held 15 cows. In that time, I guess those were modern units. Cows had to be fed. Hay, hay had to be piled in the corrals. And I can remember in the oh, mid-50s, there was one time I worked a whole year without one day off. For Hudson, life on the remote dairy left little time for play. Any friends I did get lived, you know, like a mile or so away. Milk was bottled in glass and delivered as far as South Los Angeles. It used to be most everybody got home delivery back in the early days in later days. Now, there's hardly anybody delivers milk. At one time, Hudson Dairy competed with nearly 40 other Torrens dairies, including the much larger Verberg Dairy with two operations in North Torrance. My dad, when he came down here in 1918 um, to uh, look at uh, farming land that this area was being uh, opened up for for farming by Dominguez Water Company. Milk cows weren't the only viable livestock in Torrance. James Melvin Vaquero's father began growing asparagus on Victor Street in Northwest Torrance. To round out his income, he decided to raise turkeys in the off season and eventually went into the turkey business full time. They aptly called the ranch Mira Loma, which means view of the hills. Back then, there were no homes in the area. We started out just growing and uh, processing, and uh, we kept expanding. As business grew, we ended up building a new processing plant where we could handle and be able to dress more turkeys to meet the demand. We slaughtered them and, and packaged them and delivered them, and uh, um, we never had any freezers on the ranch at all. Yeah. Just stuff to hold the birds fresh. The Vaquero specialized in a particular bird, the standard broad-breasted bronze, tough to process due to pinquill feathers that would break and leave black splotches on the bird if not fully mature. That was the, uh, that was the turkey everybody uh, wanted back in those days. Uh, the con confirmation was excellent, the big wide breasts as opposed to uh, uh, the other turkey that was popular at that particular time was the white turkey. At its peak, the ranch had more than 20,000 turkeys in residence. They enjoyed a happy free-range lifestyle in the California sunshine. Our climate here was mild enough. They didn't need sunshade during the day. And uh, so it was ideal, ideal place to raise turkey. 
Ideal, of course, until Mr. Turkey's Day of Reckoning, when it became all hands on deck at the ranch. A squeamish job for some, but not for the daughters of Mel and Betty Vaccaro. They would jump rope with the uh, insides. Entrails. Entrails. <laughs> and uh, had no qualms about it because it was just part of life. During the holidays, we probably would hire 30 people part-time just to do the slaughtering. Kids, housewives, uh, anybody that had spare time because we, didn't, we didn't, couldn't offer them any permanent employment. Farms like the Miraloma Turkey Ranch thrived here in Torrance until the 1960s when development slowly began to encroach on this valuable open space. Farming didn't fit into the master plan of Torrance's future, so the Vaccaros and other farmers slowly had to scale back their operation to make room for commercial development, homes and schools like this one. In 1960, Mel and his brother sold much of the property to housing developer Ray Watt. Some of the ranch became the grounds of Victor Elementary School. The Vaqueros stopped raising turkeys, but continued to sell dress turkeys under the Miraloma name until closing shop for good in 1985. Meanwhile, across town, the 1960s spelled trouble for Hudson Dairy and the six remaining dairies in town. City of Torrance put an ultimatum out there no more cows allowed city of Torrance after a, a date one year ahead. After selling off its ranch land, Hudson Dairy continued to operate just as a store until closing its doors for good in 1981. For the Amatsus, the farming business thrived until 1950 when Jack and his brothers joined the military and served in the Korean War. The family shut down the farm in 1959. Although the landscape in Torrance looks very different today than it did in 1923, the city's farming legacy still remains an important part of its fabric. The values and the things that went into developing our community in the first place are things that are continuing and that have contributed to making Torrance the type of city that it is today, even though farming is gone. Thanks for joining us for this look at farming's history in Torrance. In an upcoming episode, we'll meet a farming family who's managed to stay in business right here on this piece of land since the 1950s. I'm Colleen Farrell with the Centennial Oral History.